I've been thinking about uh, uh, John Weaver, the massive uh, pervert and uh, pedophile at the uh, Lincoln Project, and also all his all his buddies. Um, and initially, I thought to myself, "Man, these revelations must be so crushing and so humiliating and so disgraceful." Uh, but then it occurred to me, I had a strange thought, uh, and that is that John Weaver may be thinking to himself, wow, if I only lived in a different time and a different place, I'd be just fine. Not only that, I'd be normal. And all these other people criticizing me, they would be the strange ones. I'm thinking here of the world of ancient Greece, uh, particularly the world of Sparta, the world of the Spartan wrestling pits and all the shenanigans that went on there. Now, this was a subject shrouded in secrecy, kind of the the Greek practice that dare not speak its name, you might say, but it was the publication of K.J. Dover's book, Greek Homosexuality, about a generation ago that kicked off a real study into what was going on in ancient Greece, you may say, John Weaver country. So I kind of have this idea of John Weaver getting into a time machine, going back into the world of classical an antiquity. And let's see what he would discover if, when he got there. First of all, he would discover that homosexuality was pervasive in ancient um, Greece. Apparently the practice um, began in one part of Greece uh, and the Dorians, they were the last tribe to migrate to Greece. Uh, it came to the Dorian island uh, Crete uh, and then um, there was a practice in Crete where grown men would kidnap these adolescents and then do what they wanted with them and then this began to spread. Typically homosexuality in Greece involved an older man and a younger boy. The older man was considered to be kind of the bearded guy. He was called, um, uh, he was called the Erastes. Uh, and the younger boy was called the Aramanus. So Greek homosexuality, weirdly enough, was not between, quote, consenting adults. It was not between, let's say, two 30-year-olds. In fact, that was considered perverted. Uh, what we would consider gay was considered abnormal in ancient Greece. It had to be an older man and a younger boy. And in fact, as you look closer, you realize that this bizarre relationship, initially thought to be a prerogative of the aristocratic class, but uh, now believed to have spread even in other classes as well, this was actually based upon a theory of education. Yes, believe it or not. Uh, I think Weaver would be kind of excited to make all these discoveries, education. See, the idea here was that the, the younger boy and the older man each had something to supply to the other. There was a kind of reciprocity. And so the younger boy supplies sex. And what does the older man supply? Education, wisdom. So, you know, this is like John Weaver's like, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I've been on all these political campaigns. I mean, I've got a lot of wisdom to give. Um, allegedly, Weaver was chasing after a hundred different boys at different times, at least according to the, the reporter who broke the story. I mean, this is, um, wow, a hundred. I mean, it takes a village to please this guy. Uh, in any event, um, the uh, pedagogical theory of Greek homosexuality was this, based on this idea of reciprocity and exchanging each party supplying something to the other. Interestingly, the boy was not supposed to be sexually gratified. In fact, the word used for the boy was philia. The boy, the boy was interested in friendship and maturity, uh, and it was eros on the man's side, so kind of on the John Weaver side. Um, interestingly, there are Greek poets, Theogenes of Megara being one of them, but we also see this in, uh, I have my copy here of Plato's Symposium, and there's a remarkable speech in it by Pausanias. And Pausanias is talking about falling in love with these younger boys. Uh, and the remarkable thing is, far from considering it an exploitation of the younger boy, what Pausanias is complaining about in Plato's Symposium is that this arrangement is unfair to the older man. Why? Because these younger boys are just so ruthless and they, they use up one man and then they move to another. They abandon the older man, leaving him with his own affections and so on. So remarkably here, this is considered a relationship that is uh, cruel to the older man. Again, I can see Weaver's eyes kind of lighting up at this whole idea. Now, Socrates, of course, will have none of this. He's attracted to uh, younger boys, but he has self-control. He basically says no. 
Uh, and the younger men are attracted to Socrates. Here is uh, his Alcibiades in Plato's Symposium talking about Socrates. When I listen to him, my heart beats faster than if, than if I were in a religious frenzy and tears run down my face and I observe that numbers of other people have the same experience. He goes, nothing of this kind ever used to happen to me when I listened to Pericles. So Alcibiades was not turned on by Pericles, but he's majorly turned on by Socrates. But Socrates is not going for it. And this is the key point, and I think a point relevant to our day. What Plato is saying ultimately is that, yeah, we have these, these passions, but part of being an adult and being mature is to sublimate them, to use your reason to say no. Uh, and this is basically what John Weaver refused to do. My final point about this is this. A lot of our modern ideas of perversion in the West come out of Christianity. Uh, practices that were depraved in the Greek world are considered depraved because Christianity called them so. Uh, it was the philosopher Nietzsche who used the phrase shadows of God to refer to the moral influence of Christianity in the world. And part of what Nietzsche was saying is that if Christianity goes down, if Christian influence begins to decline, then the shadows of God will go too. In other words, our sense of what is cruel and barbaric, our respect for the preciousness of life, for example, or our abhorrence of practices like pederasty will begin to dissolve. That will be a world that John Weaver may be excited to live in, perhaps also his other buddies at the Lincoln Project, but I don't think it's a world that decent people want. I think it's a world that we should say no to, and that means we've got to fight to protect, even though it's declined perhaps, the residual influence of Christianity in our culture.